Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. What a liar I am. <clears throat> I've been lying for a long time now. The sicker you get, the more I lie to myself most of all. I cannot say how angry I am that this illness is another person in our house. <clears throat> so lies are the only way to get through each day. How hard it is to admit that I am often impatient and raging, and that anger is a pit I can never swallow, that love, even mine for you, who have been with me 40 years, cannot dissolve the hank of loneliness. <clears throat> I'm having allergy problems. The hank of loneliness that has become lodged in my throat, the irritating squeaking of your electric wheelchair. The way I want to run from the putrid smell of medicines rising from your skin. The way I lie and lie so you won't know how heavy this illness feels, how long it's been going on, 16 years now your feet dragging along the carpet on days when you can still walk or like a fingernail on a blackboard. This is all too much for you, you say, and I reassure you, no, not for you. Nothing is too much for you. I'm a burden, you say, and I say, no, no, not a burden. The face I meet, see in my mirror is not one I want to see. Oh, love, I could not have imagined it would come to this when I can only live by lying to myself and you. You with your begging eyes, your reedy voice, a clanging bell that calls me. You whom I love but cannot carry. Thank you. Thank you to all of our participants in this program. Thank you to Maria and Laura. And now we'll take a little break. We can use the restrooms. There's some uh, food on the, on the table there, some cheese and crackers and fruit. And we'll reassemble in five or six minutes, perhaps. Okay. The one thing I don't have is I don't remember things, so I have to, I didn't write that down, you may have to coach me again on that one. Okay, please take your seats so we can have this second half of our wonderful program. Oops. Maria asked me to mention that today's program is going to be televised as part of the Poetry Works USA, is that the name of it? And it's on UA Columbia Cablevision. Cable I don't know what channel that would be in this uh, part of the county. In the Patterson area, it's, do you know? Uh, the Patterson area, it's a different. It's 75, but I don't know what it is up here. But it's certainly something. It's all this whole northern New Jersey, Oakland, and, and this whole area here. If you have UA Columbia Cable Vision. So that would be something. If you have UA Columbia Cable Vision, you can turn it on and relive the day. <laughs> <laughs> and we have more wonderfulness today also. We have Vivian Shipley. I know a lot of you were just so enthusiastic when not all, not a lot of you, all of you, but the ones that I, people that I spoke to or emailed with were just so enthusiastic about the opportunity to meet Vivian Shipley and, and 
hear her read, and she's actually going to talk to us also a little bit about some interesting things. But first, let me tell you that Vivian Shipley has published five chapbooks and nine books of poetry. Most recently, all of your messages have been erased. I love the title. <laughs> Southeastern Louisiana University Press, 2010. She's a two-time recipient of the Patterson Award for Sustained Literary Achievement, and two of her books, Gleanings, Old Poems, New Poems, and When There Is No Shore, were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. And her, some of her additional honors are the Library of Congress's Connecticut Lifetime Achievement Award for service to the literary community, the Connecticut Book Award for Poetry, the Lucille Medwick Prize from the Poetry Society of America, the Robert Frost Foundation Poetry Prize, the Anne Stanford Poetry Prize from the University of Southern California, the Marble Fawn Poetry Prize from the William Faulkner Society, the Daniel Verugin Prize from the New England Poetry Club, the Hart Crane Prize from Kent State, the Connecticut Pre Press Club Prize for Best Creative Writing, and the Binghamton University Milt Kessler Poetry Book Award. And as if that is not enough, Vivian Shipley is editor of the award-winning Connecticut Review, and she's Connecticut State University Distinguished Professor at Southern Connecticut State University, where she was named Faculty Scholar in 2000, 2005, and 2008. She has a PhD from Vanderbilt University and is a member of the University of Kentucky Hall of Fame for Distinguished Alumni. And Vivian lives in North Haven, Connecticut with her husband, Ed Harris, who's here with us today. So, Vivian Shipley. Susan neglected to mention Bear and Bailey Ann. Mary and I share something. We're dog fanatics. So we have a little English bulldog named Bailey Ann and a great big old labradoodle named Bear. So, and um, my husband Ed Harris is back there and he's not the movie actor, in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, I want to thank Susan for inviting me and Maria. This is just wonderful. Um, I think I will never be able to fly again after hearing <laughs> this airplane story back here and this one up here. But I love my sons, but not that much. Um, when I um, when I hear these um, introductions, I think Marie and I were both sitting there laughing. It's sort of funny. I think if you stand around long enough with your mouth open, something's going to fall into it. So that's sort of what these introductions are about. Um, I thought today I'd sort of try to share. I'm going to read about a half an hour, but. Uh, why I became a poet. Um, I didn't start writing poetry at all until I was in my early 30s. And I'm sure I had never written a poem, was not interested in writing a poem, can't figure out why people would sit around wasting their time uh, putting words on paper, just sitting there looking at them for goodness sakes. Um, so when I was in my early 30s, I um, was pregnant with my second son and um, I started having seizures. So they figured I was pregnant and um, he was a big baby, so they thought it was due to ha having the baby. But in fact, what it was is that I had a huge brain tumor in my right frontal lobe. So they induced labor and got Todd out and told me at the time that I was going to die, that you know, they couldn't save me because I'll be 69. So this was you know, um, almost 40 years ago. I mean, I'm quite a little bit over. I was in my early 30s. But um, they took them, and it was a meningioma, so it was a self-contained tumor right up here. They took it out and put my skull back as an acrylic plate. So if you think I'm strange, I have a reason. Uh, but after I got, after I lived, um, I was in the hospital a long time, and then after I came home, I started writing poetry, and I couldn't help writing poetry. It was just pouring out of me. And I already had my PhD from Vanderbilt, I was hired at university, where I still am, had a tenure-track job. There was no reason to start writing poetry now, and I didn't ever do anything with the Victorian scholarship. And I just I couldn't help writing the poetry, and so I was lucky that my school finally, you know, let me start start teaching writing poetry. And 
um, they hired other people to teach the Victorian literature. So the point here is that I really see myself as a born-again poet, and, um, and I'm, I'm serious about that. I mean, it's not something I would have chosen, didn't choose to be. It really kind of chose me. So this um, poem is about um, the experience. I wrote this poem when I was pregnant with my third son, Matthew, and the doctors had advised me to have an abortion because they were afraid that my brain would swell again, as it does when you're pregnant, and that um, you know I would die or something bad would happen, but I decided I didn't want to. I wanted to have Matthew, and so that's been one of the great blessings of my life. But I wrote this poem before I um, went into labor to have him, to give to him, or that he could have in case I didn't um, come out of labor. And so it's called Praying Be Whole, and this is a poem that details what the operation was like, um, sort of, and um, as I said, it's written for my third son. Um, when I was pregnant with him. So praying, be whole. Learned something from Laura today. <laughs> I hold my breath as the ultrasound lines shapes of skull, thumbs, fingers like germinating beans, lungs not yet inflated, ribs thin as twigs. The aorta. I name arms, legs, spine of Matthew, the third boy to be stuffed under my heart. I have a bad memory can't recall giving birth to my second son, Todd. I was pregnant, but with a growth that did not blossom as he did. A tumor in my brain didn't part my hair or sprout from the bulb, bigger than an amaryllis, hidden above my right eye. Like a tomb, bone does not swell. Early in the morning, Caesars jerked me as if I were a puppet on strings. Todd had to tear his way out of me into his first afternoon and turn for milk for life to the hands of a stranger who fingered his cheek. No way to scalpel the heart. His cry stayed inside me to fill my breast that were left to burn, unplucked as live oak leaves that hang on to be tormented by winter wind. Even if he could have sucked my nipples, Todd's body would not have shielded me from the arteriogram, femoral stick done from a textbook diagram. The technician did not know who I was, who was being entered, or when a clot might break loose. Smell was not my baby's mouth, but sour stabs of the surgeon's breath as he pulled down his green mask to tell me the news was good. Only half of my skull would be replaced and the meningioma could be removed. Vain as ever, I knew hair grows back even on heads of the dead. A faucet of anesthesia dripped. I held my doctor's wrist as if asking him to go with me to the confrontation of something. A hospital sheet was not eased over my eyes. Breath of desire returned. Today, a nurse pins up a Polaroid of Matthew burrowing in my womb. Like weathermen, new doctors have posted my delivery chart with alerts, given me storm warnings. The tumor's souvenir, joints in my fingers have stiffened as if from deep cold. I can't stitch an heirloom quilt to leave if I do not live to hold this third son. Matthew will have these words of love. He can wrap around himself or hold up like a flare. Thank you. Now, I've tended throughout my life to do the same thing that I think all of you are doing. I really admire the work that I hear, heard, and also I'm looking forward again to reading it. Um, I'm impressed with the way she can relate, um, you know, in an audio way. I, I, I have to really see something on a page almost. But um, I wrote about things as they occurred to me. My life is, my poetry really can be sort of traced in the stages of my life, and I think it's a wonderful thing to do. I think it helps you bring control over situations often that are very difficult, times of change, times of loss. And so um, initially when I was writing, I, I always worked, and um, I'm from an era when it was not popular for women to work and raise children. I mean, many of you probably can remember this, and because uh, it said I'll be 69, and I've always worked my entire life and never stopped working. Um, and 
Um, people used to ask me, what do you do with your children when you work? So I told them, I stuff them in the closet. <laughs> but I left, them, I left them a little bread and water, you know, for the day. It wasn't, it wasn't as bad as it might sound. Um, so for years I wrote about the frustration of trying to raise children and trying to write and trying to have an identity. And one of my children, I still remember, could hold on to my leg longer than any child I have ever known. So I was trying to get out the door, you know, you're kicking them off and let me go, let me be. And so um, I don't think that I could have written poetry um, during that time if it hadn't been my job to do it. Um, because my mother was really, really good at calling me every single day and telling me what a wretched human being I was for wasting my time writing all this poetry when these poor children needed me. Uh, were they out suffering somewhere at that very moment? Uh, and I'm joking about it now, but it wasn't funny. And I'm sure many of you may have remembered. It was, it was a hard time for women uh, when they were trying to have some sort of an identity and not be defined by someone else. And so um, this is about trying to write while I was leaving my son at home. The title's Only Christ and Skater Bugs Walk on Water. Visualize your villanelle. Analyze your repeating lines. Vujja's advice is useless. My mother and her daily long distance questions about my son are effective, arouse guilt. Work like a burglar sneaking past North Haven's librarian to bag reading room silence. No sense of the rhyme words, it is hands that repeat, Todd's hands gripping my left leg as I try to ease the car door shut. Coated with the flour from a canister he pulled over his head, my son's face whiteouts, lines on paper that stiffen like percal. I draped over crib bars as I tried to trick him into napping. An umbilical cord still binds my wrist, and I cannot count five tercets a quatrain, repeat the first and third line, alternately on fingers indented with a braille alphabet lettered by Todd's teeth. Weekday mornings disintegrate, I go home, the babysitter leaves, whole afternoons fray, and I figure out why soldiers stood beneath the cross and cast lots for Christ's cloak. There were no scenes to unravel. To revise a poem, I blanket bedroom windows to prolong sleep, but a picture develops. Two-year-old hands with crocus, heads stunned, yellow as jaundice. Evergreen suit trimmed with red braid, Todd melted his spot in March snow that claimed outside toys. New, his words stiffened as if salted by breath. Rails straight, their edges were like snowdrops resurrecting frozen ground that I had troweled in October. Masquerading as Shelley, I touched each bloom to teach him faith that spring would come and about planting with double-nosed bulbs that played hide-and-seek with winter. Spearing matted oak leaves, tulips were about to open tongues of flame I'll never have. Either in mourning for saunas, sestinas I didn't write, or teaching Todd to speak, I repeated once, then twice, my voice ascending in a crescendo, flower, flower, flower. So I, for years, did a lot of writing, uh, just, again, it was kind of pouring out of me, but I didn't have the time or the energy um, to send the work out much for publication. Um, I just, you know, had it there. So that was in the days of the typewriter, you know, so there were type pages everywhere. And so um, when I turned, I guess, of about 50, um, my youngest son went away to college. And so that's when I started really trying to publish my work. And so one of the, the good things I have to say to you here as an editor, as a poet, a teacher, um, is that it's never too late to start writing and if you're writing you should be sending your work out for publication and you know shaping it it's a it's a wonderful thing to do and it's a wonderful thing to have as a lifetime interest because one of the great things about being a poet is people seem to get interested in them as they get older it's one of the few things in the world that works that way but it's true we honor our older poets and so then I went through a phase in my life where I got divorced and um, was a single mother of three small children. My youngest son was six months old when I had my first husband leave. So I had three little children and I was working full time and I was just exhausted. I mean, that was it. I mean, I was, I can still remember lying in bed and thinking, 
if someone tells me they're out in the street and they're going to get killed, I can't get up. I'm too tired. <laughs> so um, any of you who've been through, you know, this difficult divorce, um, then you may be able to relate to this. This is my son's um, hoping that his, his father would come and visit him, and he didn't. Uh, was an, an abs he was pretty much an absentee person. Um, so this is called No Six Pounders. One-legged weed in shallows, a white heron passes the time. Aim of its bill more accurate than my son's hook. Each night after Eric was born, I was an ear, fearful his breathing would stop. But sleep has come back into my summer like dark does, always catching me by surprise. Yanking out sprays of seagrass, I clear sand to let our beach rush to new growth, as I had done. A cormorant dives, making a wake in slate-faced water, a scar healing, the surface closes over what swims beneath, as I try to distract my son, keep him from repeating the question I do not hear. I can explain first that the cormorant has webbed toes, a hooked beak, and an appetite for snappers that can't be filled. As I describe how fishermen in China double knot a silken robe around one leg, using the leashed bird to catch fish, Eric interrupts to ask why his father doesn't call, visit, or bring his boat to take him fishing. Satisfied with my answers, distracted by the bobber, his bait is swallowed by huge striped bass we imagine but never catch. At the filling station, pictures of men holding up blues are our lures. Mounted jaws of sharks caught off the rocks at Morgan Point keep us casting and casting. My son is sure that if his father were here, we would catch fish after fish as he waves to every boat that passes just in case it might be him after all. To pass the time, we use a coffee can to trap a crab then another. Again, there are questions about why his father hunts but won't fish, and others I can't answer. No scientist, I don't know why lobsters turn red when boiled, but I do know there is a difference in deaths. Our fishing hook is not like the bullet his father used to kill a fox so he could snip its tail for the Harley he has bought to ride. Now, I was very fortunate, <laughs> fortunate to um, find, <laughs> find um, a, a wonderful husband in true love. We've been married over 30 years, and uh, my Ed Harris yeah, back yeah, there yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, has, has been a father uh, to our children, our sons, as we see them. And uh, so I've, I was very lucky to have, um, have uh, him come into my life. Um, after a period of relative um, peace and happiness. Um, I find it's very hard for me to write when I'm peaceful and happy. Um, for some reason, <laughs> poetry, come, poetry seems to come out of uh, despair or, or whatever, or difficulty. But um, I've written a lot of poems about other people. I like to keep other voices alive of different people who've been persecuted or you know, their voices have been silenced. And maybe it's because mine was almost by the tumor and I've been making up for it ever since. But um, at any rate, um, so I had a relative period of peace and whatever and wrote a lot of the poems, these poems that won a lot of the prizes the, um, were big, dark d poems of despair. So if you want to win Poetry Rises, you need big, dark <laughs> poems of despair. But um, then something happened that, um, gave me another um, reason for writing my poems. Um, the best poems, I think, that I write come from my heart, from my emotional self. Uh, they come out of me. They just really do sort of pour out of me onto the page. Um, like Maria's very moving poem about her taking care of her um, husband. And what I do with these poems is I then try to find some way of controlling the emotion in the poems so they don't become too overwhelmingly sentimental and that other people can relate to them. So what I try to do when I do this, is I try to find a metaphor or some sort of story or object to carry the main feeling or the main emotion in the poem. But it's really important for me to get my head and my heart together. Uh, when I try to write, and particularly when I write poems that have strong emotion in them, I'm always very afraid that maybe my heart 
has overwhelmed my head, so this is something that I try to do. Conversely, when I'm writing these other poems that I consider to be almost like lyrical history, um, I have to struggle there to get the emotion in the poems so that they aren't really just about history, just about details of somebody's life. So it's the combination of putting the two in. Like I thought, um, the, the poem about the red-tailed hawk did a beautiful job of bringing in a lot of information, and the information helped control the emotion uh, in the poem. And I think those are important things to do. This um, next poem I'm going to read is from my um, father's book, a book about my father. It's called Down of Hawk. And this is my daddy when he was 19 in front of our smokehouse in Kentucky. Um, I was born and raised in Kentucky, um, still probably consider it my home. My parents are there. I go back once a year. Um, I'm actually sort of a bona fide hillbilly. Um, and so this is Daddy. I think he looks like a, a James Dean, a hillbilly James Dean. But my father got cancer, and so I had to bring my mother and father up to Kentucky, up to Connecticut and take care of them because there wasn't anybody to take care of them there. And so um, I brought them up and I had to sell the home that my father built. And it was probably the single most difficult thing I ever did. But I was blessed to be able to take care of my father for the last two years of his, of his life in my home. And so this is a poem that I wrote about the experience of selling their house. And what I did when I sold their house, I dug up peony tubers. And I dug up box after box of them. They had come from my great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother's farms. And so I brought all these tubers up to Connecticut, and now they're all sprouting and growing like crazy. And my sons have taken some tubers from this group in to put in their own homes. So any of you who have ever moved flowers around as a way of memory, um, I think it's a wonderful thing. And so this is a poem. And going out to see these peonies makes me feel so wonderful uh, because I do feel it makes me feel connected so it's called digging up peonies overcoming fear of stalks crowding too close I remind myself it's Lexington it's June mist on fields means rattlesnakes curled in rows of corn will be cold sluggish like prying out potatoes with my fingers I dig up tubers as if I could lift my father seated with cancer if only for a day, from gravity, from ground. My parents know what I know. This is the end. They will not return to this house my father built. No refugee in Kosovo, wheelbarrowing his grandmother to safety. I will bring as much of Kentucky, of their dirt, with me as I can carry with me on our flight to Connecticut. A bride, I moved to New Haven over 30 years ago but I've never taken root. I cannot explain this urge to go to creek stone fences my father stacked, dig up box after box of peonies. I will bank into granite piled along my side garden so my father can see pink fuchsia blossoming from his bed. Is this what revision is? Change of location, tubers spreading to retell my story another time in another soil. Unable to untie what binds me to Kentucky, to bones of all those who are in my bones. I will save what I can of my mother, of my father, from this earth, from the dissolution that binds us after all. Now, um, my um, parents have both passed away. My mother died five years after my father. Memorial Day will be the anniversary of her death. And uh, she had Alzheimer's, and it was a very difficult um, five years, as any of you know who are struggling with that disease. Um, so in my newest book, All of Your Messages Have Been Erased, I have some poems about my parents uh, that I wrote in the aftermath of their death uh, to maybe make myself feel less guilty. But um, I just want to show off the cover of my book a little bit. This is a family effort. My little son designed the cover. My youngest son took the picture. And so <laughs> this is a way of giving them credit. My middle son just got promoted to associate professor with tenure. 
and this is one of his credits, his book cover. It's good to have different names. See, we've got so many different names that nobody ever knows. I've always been able to be a reference for my son, so, <laughs> so was, and Ed could too, because we have a di we've used different names professionally. But when um, my parents were sick, um, my mother was sick, um, she had moved down to North Carolina to be in a home um, for people with Alzheimer's near my sister. And so I'd gone down to visit her, and um, I left a day before her birthday um, because I had a party to give. And so um, I still feel very guilty about that, um, and uh, I did it anyway. So this is a poem I'd like to read to remind people who might be sitting here that sometimes uh, it's better to do something that's not quite what you want to do at the time, uh, but to be good to people while they're with you, because you don't want to have to write a poem like this about yourself. So it's called, I Have a Fourth of July Party to Give. A mechanic unbolting my heart from the rind of my mother's body, explaining to the nurses that I have a ham to glaze, red potatoes to boil, and peel for salad. I leave my mother a day before her birthday. Like helium in balloons I tie to her bedpost, I buoy my mother with lies about being afraid to fly on or right before this particular holiday. Shameless, I remind her about 9-11, the Twin Towers. An old woman wearing a sweater with buttons missing, slip straps held by safety pins. Why buy her anything new so close to the end? No point in jewelry, a deck of cards, crossword puzzles, television, or radio. It will be easier if there are only clothes to give away. When the music man plays Amazing Grace at the sing-along, Mother Cries. As if rehearsing how to mourn when her casket is wheeled down Hal Valley Methodist Church, I participate, belting out was lost, but now I'm found. Tapping a plastic spoon on the side of her glass, I show my mother how to keep time to was blind, but now I see. July 3rd. I picture her in North Carolina, refusing to leave the room, waiting for my call with me, the party girl, up here in Connecticut. I had propped my card on white baby's breath with red roses by her recliner. She's lifting a hand, moth-like, to tell the stoop man who sidles in for the trash that today's her 88th birthday. He doesn't understand English, but he smiles he is there with her. My mother had always bugled my duty, how she blessed the minute each day she wasn't in pain. As a girl, I never needed to ask about her mood when she hung out our laundry to dry as if she was lynching it. This morning, washing up after pulling a pork butt for the picnic barbecue, guilt, like the smell of white sheets drenching the air with bleach, stayed on fingers. Tonight, Jack Daniels and Ice in Hand, waiting for fireworks to start at Morgan Point. I am a marsh hawk, probing dune grass, not for seed, but a heart that beats. And I guess reading this is, you know, a way of trying to say I'm sorry, but you can't go back and be sorry. So if any of you here or having similar choices. Uh, I hope this poem helps you remember the choice that I made that I still you know, regret, and I feel like a terrible person, but there you go. <laughs> now, um, I'm gonna read two more poems. Um, this, um, this Greatest Hits, those of you who might be interested in entering contest, uh, I kinda got my big break about starting to publish uh, when Two of my poems won big prizes on the same day. I got the letter, the Ann Stanford Prize and then the Marjorie Lee Lynn's Prize. This has never happened again. But uh, I had something to put in my cover letter, so that was really a good thing. But this poem that I'm going to read for you, Mango Season in Cambodia, also won the New Millennium uh, Poetry Prize. And as I said, these single poems that win tend to be um, you know, longer and have pretty heavy themes to them. And I wrote this poem um, trying to come to terms with my ordinary grief of the death of my parents. I mean, each of you in here has lost someone that you love 
very much. Many of you have written very moving poems about them. Uh, but our grief in comparison to the hideous atrocities that are happening all over the world that we read about every day, um, our, gr our grief is seemingly ordinary. I mean, it's, you know, if your parents live and they're in their late 80s and they die, it's a natural course of things. And yet it's still our grief, it's still our pain. Um, and so this is a poem where I'm working with that idea. And it's called Mango Season in Cambodia. Tired of annotating my scars, trying to gain perspective about my ordinary deaths, I watch men who have given both legs to landmines scoot on wheeled wooden sleds to beg in the center of town or on the apron of a road. Not wanting to founder in grief, I avoid lure of stupas, burial monuments like one I just bought for my parents. Trees fringing field scrub or deep violet in pre-dawn and remind me of my mother's inner elbows when blood was taken or bruises on my father after early morning falls. Nothing has ever scoured me like grief of women who saw daughters dissolve on Pol Pot's forced marches north into the jungle or were forced to witness husbands being eviscerated for, greed, for sin of greed after eating forage yams. Sent to herd cattle, clear land, build huts, hearts that live through Khmer Rouge, ruptured at the suicide of sons who could not endure the crawl of that world. Ache left in those mothers that nothing will soothe helps me right myself. I'd vowed not to try and escape my loss on tour buses that chase sunrise to Angkor Wat, but learn from Cambodian food branded by the grief of Khmer cooks who parse sweet and sour notes, alternate solid and liquid, raw and boiled. As I take in bitter heat from herbs and wild greens, sourness of lemongrass opposed to that of tamarind, I can taste chicory my mother taught me to grind for coffee, dandelion I picked for salad. Tonguing young pineapple, lime vinegar, green mango, and papaya, I remember sour mash fermenting to sweetness whiskey can bring. Understanding my hunger, a chef in Siem Reap, explains that memory of curried fish laced with bamboo and water lilies nourishes his spirit. Thought of pork stewed in caramelized palm sugar sustains him. But trying to regain one perfect meal, one perfect taste he had created was as futile as trying to bring back my parents. Still, I'm on edge. Watch a street vendor make a shallow incision in a mango and pull upward lifting rather than slicing blushing skin. Even sound of the green peel ripping away is unsettling. To soothe myself, I accept his offer to sample three kinds. Flesh of the cheapest and most common is gaudy orange, fibrous and cloyingly sweet. His mid-range mango, the dusty orange gold of monk's robes, is also sweet, but slivers of sour run through it like ice. Treating myself to his most expensive mango, I let juice drip down my chin. Sweetness is balanced by spicy, musky, and tart flavors. Flesh is smooth and creamy, the color of the gold moon, or forsythia, my mother forced to bloom by putting brown sugar in a vase. I had not traveled to Cambodia for the mango season, but biting into the fruit, I found what I was seeking how it is bitterness which eventually numbs the tongue and sourness which lingers in the mouth that changes the way things taste and how the sweet becomes sweeter next to sorrow, next to grief. And the last poem I'm gonna read is the title poem of my book, All of Your Messages Have Been Erased. This was on my answering machine for years. And so I knew, you know, it gets a little message. So I always knew that I wanted to have this as a title of the book, of a book. And the book is mainly about the lives of other people whose um, names, their lives have been wiped out, obliterated, or lost. Um, uh, some very, very sad stories about them. And um, this poem is for my husband. It's called The First Poem I've Ever Labeled Love Poem. Um, and I think all of you know when you love somebody, what you fear is that one of you 
will die first. And I think usually when you love somebody, you hope it's you. Uh, but this poem is about growing older, and so it perhaps might be a fitting way of um, ending, since all of us are um, slowly but surely either maturing or not. Probably, if we're smart, we will never mature. <laughs> this is called the first poem I have labeled love poem. Your face ostrich in the New York Times, each year there's less and less to say. Hope is what almost drowned us, but we are down to three words. Will not do, will not be. For us, it is a time of having and not wanting. What we did confess our minds, still a blessing, have scabbed. The rest, it does not need to be forgiven. Water with no ambition for foam. We do not storm at each other. There are no lines dividing us like those in St. Louis, 1959, when metal plates lettered white and colored labeled two drinking fountains on every floor of your father's factory. I favor stasis because there will be no progress, but not you. The day after your 70th birthday, sick and tired of hearing me quote Wordsworth, the world is too much with us, late and soon, Getting and spending, we weigh, lay waste our powers. You finally decide to clean out our garage. Still impatient, you don't get down and move the stepladder, but stretch to pull out ears from the loft. Free falling onto concrete, you cannot get up. I think of carrying my grandfather each night upstairs in a wooden chair. Going up, I bear the brunt on the lower end. Even when my sister backed down the steps in the morning, I could not reverse the weight. Seven years younger, the only way to save myself from this sudden descent into your old age is to unbolt the hasp you have on my heart, leave you stretched out on your back. Without love, the loss of you will not be as great. But it may be too late for me to save myself, to harden a practice going to, or practice going to dinner by myself. More and more, I have told no one but you what I really think. If your body is stripped from me, who will listen to my anger, my sorrow? Last night, when you blew out all the candles on your cake, I strained to find words, compared you to an hourglass, praising the pile of sand you'd formed to keep us both from looking at how few grains were left. I was never the type to blow kisses willy-nilly into the wind. And you won't make promises about years you might not deliver. Knowing wanting will not make them happen. Yet, our bodies have memory, wings we can hinge on to lift us. Weren't we something in the back seat of my yellow Porsche Targa? Bombay gin, India pale ale, dancing on the deck to little feet. I'll be your Dixie chicken if you'll be my Tennessee lamb. And we will walk together down Dixie land, Dixie land. A precise man with words, but no William Sapphire. To please you, I learned dusk as a dim part of twilight that marks beginnings of light, night. If I can't stop gnawing at days we have left, I'll fast forward, erase the twilight just after sunset when we sit watching our dogs swim out into the cove to chase blue herons unfolding to heaven. If I could, I bind us to a bench you bolted into Morgan Point's pink granite, to this spot of earth we own, to Bear and Bailey the Bulldog, who bring us such happiness. We've lived with sea, waves have taught us what is planted in sand will disappear like sandpiper tracks on wet shore. The Chinese artist, Song Dong, keeps a daily diary in water on stone. But why write a life when words will evaporate? Surely, knowledge of loss will teach me to cherish our sliver of time before darkness stows you in my heart. A girl in Kentucky, I learned a way to keep you with me from my grandmother, who taught me that as the soul rises from earth, it goes to what it knows. So I will hang Cabernet Sauvignon bottles you emptied at night in the white pine's branches to catch your spirit. And if wind off Long Island Sound rocks them, You'll stir and call out to me through the long nights. A boy in Missouri, milk delivered to the doorstep, was in glass bottles capped with wax paper. There were two kinds of kids, those who love film floating under the lid, 
and those who would not touch the scum. Never one to peel skin from surface, you don't share my fear of nothing. Believe there's no more to life than life. Still, I pray I feel air shift when I say your name, smell you, or when I enter a room. Neither of us prefers survival, but one of us will blow out the pilot light, leaving the other to finger our answering machine. All of your messages have been erased. Thank you. Thank you. And I just think this is such a wonderful event and wonderful day. I mean, I'm so grateful to be a part of it. And each of you who has um, put a wonderful poem or poems in this anthology, you've created a message that will not be erased. And for the three people here who have helped each of you create something permanent, I think that's one of the most significant things about art and one of the most satisfying things it can do. And I really urge you all to you know, continue writing. I urge you to try to publish your work. Um, I'd be glad to talk to any of you if you have any questions about publishing. As I said, I brought quite a bit of material back there to share with you. But uh, I just think it's, it's a wonderful gift to be able to write and to be able to share your own intimate self um, with others and to maybe help them, help them, help others guide um, through difficult times by sharing what you've experienced. So thank you all very, very much. If you do have any questions for Vivian Shipley, she's been so generous and with her time and continues to be so, saying that she will be happy to discuss these things with you. So would you prefer to do it here or would you prefer to do it informally over there? Well, okay, do you have some, and does anybody have something that they want to ask right from your seat for everybody else? Yes, Simone. Oh, my friend Simone says she'd like to know whether any of your three boys share your talent. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my middle son is a, a graphic design person, but I don't know. I think it's for want of something else to do. But um, no, I mean, and I actually don't think that, I mean, they love me, but being a poet strikes me as being something that you do so intensely it's your life and yet for all the people around me nobody's interested in my poetry or that I'm a poet. Um, I'm reminded of an event I went to recently, Billy Collins, you all have probably heard of, um, had given a graduation speech. So my friends had a graduation party for their daughter and Billy came, they knew him, and nobody wanted to talk to him. And so he was there all by himself. He was named Poet Lord of the United States the day after. So Susan kept saying to me, go talk to him for goodness sakes. And it wasn't that they were intimidated or they just, why would you want to talk to a poet for goodness sakes? You know, so, so I really think it's like um, you write poetry because you need to, but it's, it's not something that mostly your neighbors or your friends or do and they'll, they'll say, oh, you're a poet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so don't you find that's true? <laughs> yeah. And so my real life with my grandchildren, my husband, sons, is apart from this. Yeah? What are the pseudonyms that you use? Um, none. Shipley is my name, my maiden name. So I've had that. I did publish a few poems under my first husband's name, which was Jokel, but they're hopefully gone now. Actually, he, he used one of my poems in court against me when we got a divorce. That was a not, another long, ugly story, too, there, but whoa, what can I say? Uh, no, I, there's, there are a lot of subjects also, though, I've stayed away from uh, because I haven't wanted to talk about them, I guess, out of respect for my sons. And, uh, but I have written a number of bad son poems. I had, my, kid, my kids were all wild. They were keg partiers. And so the minute we'd leave town, like 
we come home with our hearts in our throat because we were sure that somebody had had a cake party, and we were generally right, you know. Um, <laughs> the fish pond had fell, fallen in, supposedly, because my son was trying to rescue the cat that was drowning, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, we, we went through a lot of parties, and so I have written some bad, bad sun poems. And they're, they're usually pretty popular with uh, college audiences because they're all bad boys and kids, and they do these things, and they're all sitting there, you know, arming each other. I read recently at West Point and read one of those poems about my son and this woman said to the colonel, she said, sir, do I have permission to ask her a question, sir? And he said, yes. So she goes, ma'am, can I ask you a question, ma'am? They ma'am me at a death. I'm so, yes, ma'am. She said, doesn't your son get angry when you read that poem, when you wrote that poem? And I said, I don't care. He shouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> So poetry is not only a way to vent grief, it's a way to get even, too. <laughs> you be bad and I'll write a poem about you. <laughs> but it's fun. Yes? When you've written a poem, uh, do you ever offer it, do you ever wish that there would be someone who would critique it? Are there people who you trust to critique it before you consider it finished? Yeah, my husband doesn't like poetry. I mean, it's not that he doesn't like it. He's just fine of saying he loves a poet. Uh, but he is a very, he's very good. Um, I was amused with the story about the red pencil because um, my husband is, he used to be a proofreader and he's meticulous. And he can also spot when something's like false in a poem or is not working. And um, he's also great at spelling. And so I always recommend, I can't spell, so I always recommend one way of hooking up with somebody is if you're a good speller, advertise it. You know, if you're going out to a bar hanging out, say, I can spell. I mean, that'll get you, that'll get you more people than anybody else. But he reads, he reads my work and critiques it. And one of the things that I've used contest for is to test work. Um, I've forgotten now who it was, but someone was saying the poem First Ice, which I wrote about picking up my father's gravestone, won the Robert Frost Prize. And um, I wrote that, and I was terrified of it because it was so, such an emotional poem for me. And for a long time, I had difficulty reading it until somebody taught me that when you're going to come to a part where you're going to cry, stop and breathe, and it stops you from crying when you're out public. I don't know why. But I sent that poem out to the Frost Prize thinking I would test it. Uh, and it won, so I figured it was okay. Because I was afraid with that that I had fallen through in just total blithering sobbing, you know, on the page, which puts people off. I mean, all of you probably have had the experience of asking someone how they are and they break out crying. You think, oh, I wish I hadn't asked you this. <laughs> but but you don't want you don't want to be sobbing on the page. It's okay to be sobbing on the page as long as you do it, you know, in sort of a dignified way. But so I often to test poems, I'll enter them in contest. Um, you know, if the contests are anonymous and if they've got, you know, they announce the judges and stuff, I think it's a wonderful way of testing your work. And also, I think trying to publish is a wonderful way of testing your work. If the work doesn't get published and comes back enough, often when I do workshops, there's a lot of things I suggest that you try doing to it. Um, I have one poem that got rejected probably 98 million times, and I changed the title to How Many Stones Weight Virginia Woolf's Pockets, and it got just hooked up like that. Same exact poem, not a word change, just different title. And so, but that, that's the way that I test. And as I said, Ed reads my poems. I've never, I never had the chance or the, I guess, the, the luxury of going to writing workshops. I mean, I've just worked all the time and I raised my kids and then and just kind of keep working. But um, I think having somebody who critiques your work is a wonderful thing. And these workshops that people do, it's, you know, it's what I teach at school and do a lot of them out. They're wonderful ways of uh, critiquing, but I think if you've got a friend who's got a good red pencil, it's invaluable. And cutting is important too. <laughs> cutting out all these words that you don't need. Cutting for me is the worst thing, as you can probably hear, because my poems are long and filled with detail. I just, I just think too much of everything is just enough in there. Let's just stick a few more details in. But that's my problem. I like details. Any other questions? Any of you who um, are interested in like emailing me or you know, sending me some work, I'd love to see it. I have under the submission guidelines, there, my email is address is there, it's Southern. So um, I'd love to see your work. And if you ever come up to New Haven, she was up there last week, had I known, um, just give a holler and I'll wine you and dine you. Probably promise I won't push you over the seawall. 
but <laughs> but thank you all very much. Has books um, for sale on the table in the back, and I'm sure she'd be happy to sign um, her her book for you if you want to purchase one of her books. And Laura has books in the back, as do I. So do you. Uh, and and uh, so I'm sure that everybody would be willing to sign a book if you wanted. And meanwhile, enjoy talking to each other. And thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Susan, for all the work you did in organizing these. Uh, sessions that we had. Let's give another round of applause to everyone.